The Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the seventh chapter. Soon afterwards, Jesus went to a town called Nain. <coughs> Excuse me. And his disciples and a large crowd went with him. As he approached the gate of the town, a man who had died was being carried out. He was his mother's only son, and she was a widow. And with her was a large crowd from the town. Then he came forward and touched the buyer, and the bearer stood still, and he said, Young man, I say to you, rise. The dead man sat up and began to speak, and Jesus gave him to his mother. Fear seized all of them, and they glorified God, saying, A great prophet has risen among us, and God has looked favorably on his people. This word about him spread throughout Judea and all the surrounding country. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Assembly may be seated. <clears throat> Sisters and brothers in Christ, grace and peace to you in the name of our Lord and our Savior. Amen. <clears throat> when my mother died five years ago, January, I was overwhelmed by the response of um, sympathy and um, expressions of sorrow. Um, but I was surprised by the people who came um, to simply see my dad and the rest of us who were there. And the people who came to the prayer service the night before the funeral service and also came to the service, people who didn't know my mom, co-workers of my two sisters who came from Fargo, um, a pastor colleague who was serving in Mayville. He would never met my mom, but he and his wife came. And so something I wondered, really, why did they come? When death and life collide, death loses. In the town of Nain, there are two processions that, in a sense, collided, or they met at the gateway of the town of Nain. Nain is a town south of Nazareth, Jesus' hometown. One group is Jesus, his disciples, and a whole big crowd. They, be, they were coming from Capernaum, which is further north. The other group was a funeral procession. Very different groups. One, I can imagine the one with Jesus being um, with them, that there was this kind of excitement or amazement. They're still talking about the healing that had taken place in Capernaum, where Jesus did not even go to the, to the home of the centurion. And yet the servant was healed when the messengers returned to the centurion's house. The funeral procession is filled with mourning and sorrow. The man who's being carried out for burial in the cemetery is the only child the only son of this widow woman. The woman's uh, situation is even more dire of losing her son. That's one of the most painful things for a parent to experience, to lose a child. But at that time, in that place, women were not able to be independently, financially secure. So they were dependent upon a male relative, whether it's a son or a husband, a brother-in-law. And so this widow, it, it seems that she does not have that safety net. So her future, her, her well-being, her livelihood is very uncertain. Perhaps she thought, I might even end up on the streets. Jesus had compassion for her, and he broke away from his entourage of excitement and news of healing and life, and he joins the procession, the group where there is sorrow and uncertainty. He is moved with compassion, that he, he goes to suffer with this woman. His response is not simply thinking or anything abstract, it's, it's very physical, that Jesus 
feels deep down in his gut the suffering of the woman. The Greek word that is translated to compassion that we read <laughs> comes from a word that literally, literally means the intestines. That is a very visceral sort of feeling, this feeling of compassion that Jesus has for the whole situation for the woman. There are two other places in the gospel, Luke, where this particular word is translated into compassion. The parable of the Good Samaritan and also the parable of the prodigal son. And in all three of the, these, those two parables, as well as today's story about the, the funeral procession in name, all three people, Jesus, the Samaritan, and the father of the prodigal son, they respond with, com they, they feel compassion, and the response is unorthodox. They, they put themselves at risk by what they are moved to do. Jesus uh, puts himself in a position of uncleanliness and also judgment because when he touches the buyer, that is the kind of the, the platform that they're carrying the dead body on, he makes himself unclean. So he could not go into the synagogue or the temple until he became ritually clean again. He would not be able to interact with some people until he cleansed himself. The response of the Good Samaritan put himself at risk his, his own personhood, and he also paid for the care of the man who had been hurt. And the father who runs out to his son um, throws his um, dignity aside to welcome his son and throws a party. Jesus feels and he suffers with the woman, and he breaks away from the crowd and he comes. And he says, arise, young man. And he brings life to a place where there is death and returns the son to his mother. Not only did she receive the son when he was born, but again, a new life when Jesus resurrects him to new life. It is that compassion that prompts Jesus' action. Most often in the Gospel of Luke, when there is a healing, there's some sort of um, pleading or asking for healing, or afterwards there might be a word of gratitude. But we don't see this in the account of the widow and the son who is dead in the town of Nain. So a mother does not come and ask Jesus to, to bring her son back to life. That's probably just out of her reality. It's not even something to consider because her son has been dead so long. There's no record of the son nor the mother saying, thank you, responding with gratitude. But it's all about what Jesus does. It is not dependent upon the mother. It is not dependent upon the son, what Jesus does. But it's Jesus who feels his compassion, and he is moved to respond with action. Henry Nouwen, Catholic priest and writer. He describes Jesus' life of compassion as a pathway of downward mobility. When we talk about mobility, we don't think of being downward, but Jesus is um, living out his compassion, responding to the compassion that he feels. It's a path of downward mobility. That Jesus chooses pain and rejection, and becoming unclean, and even death itself, instead of choosing a path of upward mobility, where there might be prestige and power and wealth. And Jesus does not just reach down and pull up those who are um, hungry, are starving, who are mourning, but rather he goes down to them. He goes to the people, he goes to the place where they are. And that is a very different kind of notion than what we might think of helping those who are less fortunate than I or you might be, serving at a soup kitchen, um, giving to victims of natural disasters. Clearly, clearly, these are needed responses by our part. They are important ways to respond as we serve Jesus, but it's, we're still able to maintain some sort of physical distance. We're still able to maintain a position of privilege. Jesus goes directly to the people and to the place where they are. A few weeks ago, I read a story about three men, young men, um, who had been hearing all kinds of news or stories about refugees. 
And some of the information that they were reading, hearing, was in direct conflict to one another. So they decided to go to a refugee camp and live among the people to try to figure out what is really the, the truth and what is um, behind a lot of things that we are hearing. So going through the proper channels to make a long story short, they went to a refugee camp and they were giving their starter kit. A tent that they would um, set up, that would be one tent among hundreds of tents in the refugee camp. And a few things that um, they would need to live in this tent. So they went to their designated place among these hundreds of tents and they began to try to figure out how to put up their tent. And it did not take long for their neighbors who also lived in the refugee camp the tents to come and to help them and to be invited to a neighboring tent. And they began to build a relationship with these refugees and to hear the story of why they are there and what are they hoping for and who they are. To move from fear to friendship. Last Monday, Shane Claiborne spoke at UND and some of us from our saviors went there to hear what he had to say. And he said, relationship. That is um, what we all need, are called to do, to build relationships so that we can move from fear or suspicion to friendship. Our God is a relationship God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. God, the God self itself is relationship, and we are called into that relationship with God. The people who came to sit with my dad and those who I was surprised to see at my mother's funeral and prayer service, I believe that they were moved to walk a path of downward mobility, that they came to suffer with, to be with those of us who were mourning the death of my mother. Sometimes we are on the receiving end of the compassion of Christ that works its way through and uh, with God's people. And sometimes we are on the giving side where we are moved, our inner core that we can do no other than to go and to be with that person. And we might not think that we have much to bring. Sometimes all we have to bring is a hug and our own tears. But we suffer with that person or those people. And sometimes, sometimes you figure out what you can do after you get there. But you simply go because you are compelled, the Holy Spirit drives you to this path of downward mobility. That Jesus came down to be with us. He lowered himself to be both human and divine, to be among us, to suffer with us, to cry with us. Amen. The song of the day is Jesus.